I'm uh, Manuel Martinez, and this is a story called Trash Fish. The shrimp man's using his pocket knife to push the fish around in the skillet. It's the same knife that he used to cut the bait into strips and to jimmy open the door when we were done fishing and came back to his house, and that's just one more reason I don't want to eat here. <laughs> The fish he's cooking aren't much bigger than what my father and I usually use for bait. So small that my father and the shrimp man didn't even bother cutting the heads or the tails off. Just scaled and gutted them before the shrimp man shook them around in a bag full of cornmeal and dropped them into the oil. My mother's biggest fear is that one day she'll wake up and nobody will be able to tell her from the fat, dark-skinned women who sit on the weedy banks of the canals and use cane poles to catch bucketfuls of perch. So when my father and I go fishing alone, we fillet and skin our dolphin or grouper into perfect white strips that we lay out on clean ice for the ride home because my mother won't allow a piece of fish in her house if it still looks like it came from a fish. Nigger food, she calls it. I'm sitting on the couch, and the only thing for me to do besides pick at the stuffing that's coming through a worn spot in the cushion is watch the shrimp man drink his beer. He tilts his head back and keeps it there, and as long as I don't look at the snotty-looking sockets where his eyes used to be, then it seems like he's trying to read something on the ceiling. My father gets three beers from the refrigerator, one for each of us, but I don't take mine because I'm still nursing my first. It's the first beer I've drunk in front of him, and I don't want to seem too used to it. But when he offers me a cigar, I take that because it gives me something to do with my other hand besides playing with the stuffing in the couch. My father sits down at the table with both beers in front of him. He rolls his cigar between his teeth and everything is quiet except for the hiss of the gas burner and the bubbling of the oil. The room is big, but there are old newspapers and magazines and strange looking reports stacked up all along the walls. So much yellowed and roach eaten paper that around the edge of the room, the, uh, the couch and the table are crowded next to the kitchen. My father and the shrimp man and I are so close that we could all reach out and touch each other if we wanted to. The grease is smoking and I can smell the fish starting to burn, so I figure that the shrimp man can smell it too. He can do some amazing stuff for a blind guy, can move a knife around a fish even faster than my father, and can put his hands on a sputtering outboard and tell you what's wrong with it. But it's like he doesn't notice what's happening in the skillet, and between the smoke from the grease and the smoke from the cigar, things seem even more unreal than they already are. If my father isn't going to say anything about the burning fish, I sure as hell am not going to. I try not to speak to the shrimp man unless I have to. I still haven't gotten over seeing him stick the tip of a Phillips head screwdriver into one of his eye sockets when I was eight. He tilted his face down at me, and with his big, toothless mouth open from laughing, knocked it around in there for a while. And if I think too hard about it, I can still hear the thudding of the screwdriver like it's happening in my own head. I'm not afraid of the shrimp man anymore, just wary. You have to watch out for anybody who thinks showing that to an eight-year-old is funny. <laughs> the shrimp man pushes the pusher fish around in the skillet some more and takes a few swigs of beer before he finally stabs the fish with his knife and takes them out of the grease dropping them onto the paper plate. He carries a plate to the table, and as he puts it down, he says, you can get them cots from out the shed after we eat. I picture my mother sitting alone in our living room, her feet tucked up under her and her shoes still on, feeling as if all the neighbors that we barely know can see through their walls and ours too, feeling as if whatever they are seeing is proof that she hasn't risen above anything and I want to call her and tell her where we are. But my father has started setting the table with paper plates and plastic forks, has brought out hot sauce and more beers too, even though none of us needs them. Let's eat, my father says, and I know that I need to sit down and eat the burned fish and forget about calling my mother. I know that if I call before my father wants me to, it will be a long time before he offers me beer and cigars like this. If I don't do what he wants, 
he might never again put a piece of fish on my plate and tell me, I think this is the one you caught, before looking up at the ceiling and reciting the closest thing to a prayer that I have ever heard him say, thanks to the fish and to him who caught it. I just want to say before I begin, thank you to Noreen and to Kristen, who have been of the utmost help and to throw really great parties. <laughs> um, I'm going to be reading an excerpt from a short story. It's the beginning of a story. And one thing that I will say is that the narrator is a man. Not the man, but a man. <laughs> um, it's called Locks for Love. It's been growing longer than I've known her, and it would be easier if I didn't want it. You can't argue with philanthropy. I'm up against victims. Suddenly, I'm the bad guy, even though I've never been a man mothers warn daughters about. I was born and raised in the Midwest by a married Methodist couple. I have no touring band. Last week, I went to church and put a five in the basket when they pass it around, even though that's 20 minutes on my pay scale. But then there are times like this morning and it's like I've got to fix my reputation with my own wife or she'll get rid of it. So this morning, I was lying on our couch with the television on when click, Margarita locking the door and Django putting her purse down. When she comes into the living room, I grab her by the belt loop to get her on board the HMS couch. That's a little joke I had to clarify to her the first time. And picture this. I am all kinds of excited because there is a rock exhibition opening at the museum in two days and I am planning to take her. Rocks are not just big dirt, as I've explained to Margarita. Rocks are the superheroes of the natural world, strong, silent, immortal. This is maybe the best date I'll ever come up with, besides our first, where she ate three slices of pepperoni and I started singing this song I made up on the spot about how she made my heart feel like dough getting thrown in the air to make a perfect pizza pie. But she said she'd made the appointment, and when I protested, loosened herself of me. I suppose you think everyone doesn't need hair, she said. She has changed, won't take flowers. She says it makes her sad to see them so pretty, petals open to the brink, when she knows they'll be nothing but dead by Thursday. She thinks about cholesterol. She wants to cut her hair off and give it to bald people with cancer. I loved her the first second I saw her. I spread that hair over my chest like a blanket the first time we made love. That night, when everything that has happened was still to come, I swam in that hair of hers straight to the horizon and touched the rising sun of us. She was a stripper then. How many hairs are there in the world, I asked, and it has to be yours? Mine, exactly, she said, or I suppose you think yours. I don't know when this mine and hers thing started, but it's definitely after we were married. It's like she's been writing up a postnuptial prenuptial the last year. It's my hair, and I can give it away if I want. I'm the one who has to look at herself in the mirror every day. You don't see you, though. I see you, I said, outside the mirror. She has been losing her big butt with grass juice she juices herself. I don't mind so long as the hair stays. See, it was this hair that first caught my attention when I saw her in the subway station. I said to her that her hair was like this rock I'd heard about, obsidian, and she asked if I was a geologist. A geologist? Well, that just bowled me. I am in love with that girl who thought I was a rock doctor. <laughs> you don't see me at all, but what is it you think you see? She zings real well like that, and all the while I've got a head full of marshmallow fluff, thinking things about how when she crosses her arms, it's an issue of perspective, so that it's like either she's holding a baby in the pretty slope of her elbows, or mad as hell. I see a girl healthy as a horse, black beauty, legs longer than the grocery store line on a Sunday, my girl. A horse, she said. Now I'm being compared to a horse. Maybe the black beauty was a mistake. I was still a little dopey from getting stoned with Carm and Fat Ted while she was at work. And why was I getting stoned? Because the truth is, lately, it's like I'm watching her through a hole in the fence, but we're in the same room. 
It's not just the hair or the flowers. She has been making my ears spill over with health nuts stuff, and she wants me to get a better job. She asks me how we're ever going to have a future, as though it's not passing through us and disappearing, turning into afterthoughts every minute. Are you listening to me? She said. Whenever we fight, the dog Skipper, he throws a tantrum like a little kid. He bares his teeth and runs around the room, over the furniture, climbing up the walls practically, circling this circling merry-go-round hound. Margarita hates this, gets angry to the point she regresses into Spanish. The meanest thing she ever said to me in a fight was that she wished she'd never married me for a green card. Why don't you go drink some arugula juice, I said. <laughs> that was the best I could come up with. She apologized later, but she didn't take it back. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming, and um, thank you for the Center for Fiction, um, Noreen and Kristen and Leslie and the cigarette. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and thanks to the fellows, it's, it's really cool to hear everyone read out loud, and, um, it's very beautiful. Um, this is a, uh, an excerpt from a novel, um, I think all you need to know are there are three girls who are home alone, um, there's a middle-aged man who's been uh, circling the block. Um, a dog has run away, and um, the oldest daughter has gone out to sort of look for it. Um, <clears throat> that's when you turned on a beach street for the fifth time, Oscar, and saw Ellie walking on the sidewalk in her nightgown. It wasn't proper. You leaned over as you drove and rolled down the passenger side window. Everything all right there, Ellie? Ellie looked at the truck at you, her face full of cranks and shafts. It was her face, but you saw your own mechanicality. Oh, Oscar, you couldn't even get her into your truck. Go away, she said, and you did. You drove away, turned a couple of corners, and then you bawled. Tears blurred your vision. You pulled over so you could sob. Sometimes when you're eating dinner alone, you stop with a knife and a fork in your hands, and you bow your head and you think so perspicaciously, this is all just part of an eternity. And you imagine a man opening the kitchen door, walking briskly up behind you, and whacking you so hard on the back of the head with a metal bar that you're dead, and your head is a dead apple. Ellie couldn't remember why she was outside. She turned back toward home, stepped gingerly, adhering to the center of the sidewalk as to a gangplank. If she could walk a straight line long enough, perhaps she wouldn't feel so saddled by her thoughts. She walked for several blocks, and then she found little Anne Marie prostrate on the sidewalk in front of the house, crying. Anne Marie had been standing on that spot, watching for, for their dog Ike when she fell asleep and landed on her lip. Ellie led her to the downstairs bathroom, and in the mirror, Anne Marie saw a thick stripe of blood descending her chin. She sputtered and then cried again as Ellie wiped away the blood with a damp washcloth. But she'll be okay. She's not crying now. She's looking with wonder into the mirror at the jag under her lip. Tomorrow morning, her first day of kindergarten, she'll introduce herself by pointing to the jag and saying, this is where I bit through my lip. And who knows, Oscar? You'll probably be okay too, because as you were wiping away your tears, you saw Ike sitting in the glare of your headlights, head tilted to the side. Had he heard you crying? Had you sounded like a dog crying? You opened the passenger side door, he trotted over and jumped in. Now you're driving and he's sitting at the center of the passenger seat watching you. Maybe he won't be missed. Edgar never liked him anyway, and besides, Edgar's family has other problems. Like right now, Edgar and Sarah are pulling into their driveway in the little blue station wagon. Edgar is noticing something in Meg's window as he shifts him to park. Someone is peeking through the blind. Edgar leans out his window and looks up there, and now no one is peeking through the blind. Meg must be doing something she's not supposed to be doing, he's thinking. Now he's jogging to the front door instead of walking. What's wrong, Sarah's asking. Nothing, he's saying. He's thinking he'll run up to her room. He's suspecting she's smoking pot. 
As he's going up the porch steps, he's hearing a sound like a bull charging down the stairwell. He's barging through the front door and seeing the backside of a stocky man, a boy, a black person, fleeing down the hallway, and now he's running too. Edgar is chasing Brett through the kitchen and out the back door. Brett's wearing a white t-shirt over a red t-shirt. His hair is woven in a tight tapestry. It's a long run across the backyard. Brett's stumbling and almost falling because, he's, because as he's running, he's holding up his jeans, which he didn't have time to zip and button. He's scared the hell of, Osk, of Edgar, and he's jumping into the creek. He's being swept away just a little more slowly than he ran. Edgar is almost jumping in after him, but that boy's head is dipping up and down in the creek like an otter's head. And thinking about his own safety, Edgar is stumbling to the ground to keep himself from momenting into the creek. Now Meg is running out the back door and across the backyard. Don't hurt him, she's yelling, almost tripping because she's holding up her jeans as she runs. What drama in that family. And look at you, Oscar, driving home with Ike. It'll be good to be home. But if you could swing it, wouldn't this be the perfect time to be floating down that creek? Not on your back. You'd be afraid of sinking. Maybe in a canoe. No oars. Just the current to take you along. You'd sit in the canoe, your elbows on your knees, your chin in your hands, a pondering man. Watching the silhouetted, silhouetted tree branches pass overhead like slow, hoary claws swiping. No, not like claws. Like slow, hoary very twisted and ugly, but very harmless. Not even ugly, not swiping. Slow, hoary hands ushering. You'd float by Edgar's house, the windows bright, golden. You'd come to where Edgar has fallen near the bank, and you'd yell, Edgar, it's not so bad. And maybe he'd yell after you, Oscar, don't stop stopping by. I think maybe sometime we might need you. You'd wave, then put your elbows on your knees and your chin in your hands, the tonnage of you floating. Thank you. Hi. My name is Jackie Reitzis, and I would like to thank the Center for Fiction for this amazing opportunity. To my friends who are here tonight, who are also my New York family, and to all of you for coming out to listen and my beautiful felons. Um, I'm going to read from the beginning of a story entitled, All This Uncontained. The day is cottony, and Eric is driving us to the state park in his hybrid car. He's got on aviators and a white t-shirt, just a bomber jacket away from cliche, and he's gunning these quiet, fragrant streets like they've done something to offend him. We're going so fast, I feel like I'm on the talking rocket ship of the three-and-a-half-year-old I babysit. Gregor is mostly good at steering it, but occasionally, when he crashes into the dishwasher, the rocket ship says, ouch, and the three-year-old says, oi. Approaching warp speed, says the rocket ship. Flanking the houses of the residential neighborhoods, the pines drape mini cones, their greenish needles splayed like spines. I roll down the window and let the peat mossy spring air rush in. Shifting into third gear and removing his shades, Eric looks haggard in this rugged sort of way. His cheek unshaven in profile, the way exhaustion is a blues song. He hasn't been sleeping lately. At night, he just lies still staring at the ceiling as if enduring an unending MRI. I crack my ankle. Sometimes I mean to. Sometimes it snaps on its own as I cross a room or climb stairs. Eric cringes but says nothing. He has asked me to refrain, convinced it's something I could choose to control if I would only apply the necessary discipline. But I tell him it doesn't feel like a choice, it feels like a need. He sighs. Even after years together, his disapproving noises can still leave me splintered. Something is off with him these days, our conversations growing futile like trying to sip soda at the movies through a split straw. On three different mornings this week, he minimized the screen on his laptop when I ambled past him into the bathroom. When I asked what he's doing, he replies with fantasy baseball or world headlines, famines, floods, fires. The 
Samantha's, the women I babysit for, say honesty is everything. When I'm over there babysitting, they tell each other when there's spinach in their teeth and which clothes make them look heavy. Eric's cell phone buzzes in his pocket. He downshifts. It's a woman's voice, but her words are muffled. He straightens his posture and asks if he can call her later. When I ask who it was, he replies it's about a new project he's tasking. Asteroid ahead. In the apartment, he's growing neater, his sweaters folded, stacked, and arranged by color in his drawers. Now he gets his suit steamed on his lunch hour. He is taken to lint rolling the cat. <laughs> the surfaces he's allocated in the apartment is his own, his half of the dresser, his bedside table, his corner of the bathroom sink, shine with the effulgence of absence. Eric is working as a financial planner and has been for a while now, though when he started he swore it would just be to pay off his student loans. We met at the Botanical Gardens, where I still work as a guide under the Samantha I met first. He was an environmental science major. I like to tell him that he put the mental in environmental, but at times he's dry as toast. I wait for, I'm waiting for him to return to ecology, to sink his arms back into the dirt that used to rub off onto me with sweat. But I know his daily soul sucking, as he calls it, is partly my doing. Because of me, he is planted here, because I can't quite seem to finish college or leave the town where I was born, not yet. It's not all bad, I remind him, the soul suckage. His firm prints portfolios on recycled stock. I have an endless source of jokes about hedge funds. <laughs> His parents want him to move back to their farm in California, where they grow crops of lemons and oranges and peaches and almonds. Anything is better than moving back home with your parents. In the car, I have that airport intercom feeling in my chest a pining for someone who's in the same room but feels far away. The slow swirl of wind on pavement, a smattering of maple seed pods sorry, slicing through the air like small helicopter rotors, unhinged. Welcome to Jupiter. We stopped to picnic at the height of the rim trail overlooking the gorges. These waterfalls also drop down into the small college town where we live. They all have their own personalities, waterfalls. This one's shy and slick. This one, a battery of sound, an outpour, a deluge upon stones. This one, almost apologetic, a great man's beard. Like love, you only really want the ones you have to make a special trip for. Thank you. Seamus Scanlon, you can probably guess where I'm from, so I won't tell you. Um, I just wanted to thank the Irish weather because the 50 shades of grey clouds that fly over us every day and drench us day and night, even in the summer, makes us into such sunny <laughs> this first story is going to prove it. I'm actually going to try and do two stories. So one is a flash fiction piece, and the other is the end of uh, kind of a love story, Irish style. So the first one is called The Long Wet Grass. The resonance of tires against the wet road is a mantra, strong and steady. The wipers push rain away in slow rhythmic arcs into the surrounding blackness. The rain falls slow and steady, then gusting, reminding me of Galway when I was a child, where Atlantic winds flung broken fronds of seaweed onto the prom during high tide, before the death harmony of Belfast seduced me. The wind keeps trying to tailgate us, but we keep sailing. The slick black asphalt sings on beneath us, we slow and turn onto a dirt road, the clean rhythm now broken, high beams tracing tall reeds edging against the road, moving rhythmically back and forth with the wind, no lights now from oncoming cars. We stop at a clearing, I open the door, the driver looks back at me, the rain on my face is soothing, the pungent petrol fumes comfort me, the moon lies hidden behind black heavy clouds, I unlock the trunk. You can barely stand after lying curled up for hours. 
After a while, you can stand straight. I take the tape from your mouth. You breathe in the fresh air. You breathe in the fumes. You watch me. You don't beg. You don't cry. You are brave. I hold your arm and lead you away from the roadway, into a field, away from the car, away from the others. The gun in my hand pointed at the ground. I stop. I kiss your cheek. I raise the gun, I shoot you twice high in the temple. The coronas of light anoint you, you fall. The rain rushes to wipe the blood off. I fire shots into the air, the ejected shells skip away. I walk back to the car and leave you there lying in the long wet grass. I also do children's parties. <laughs> so the story is called um, The Butterfly Love Song. It's a bit complicated. There's a butterfly knife in it, and the protagonist uh, dresses up when he's watching TV programs. So he uses a butterfly knife when there's a nature program on. Uh, anyway, these two skinheads come over one night and they order him to come and visit their sister. And so this is him after, you know, you can't believe this, so he goes over. So at 7.29 p.m., fashionably early, I called around to shave Block. Thank God the twins were out. Block Mayor answered the door and she did a double take. Not a blade carrying same, just me, the suitor in shining armor with the tenuous grasp of French sexuality, fashion and reality. She turned around and shouted, it's the fucking butterfly nut. I couldn't believe the blocks had told their mother. I imagined they passed each other in sullen silence in the hallways and narrow corridors of the house. It was nothing sacred. You better come in, I suppose. She herded me through the hallway into the TV room. I use the term loosely. Lucy Block was sitting on the sofa watching TV. She slowly looked up at me. I gave her a half hesitant salute. What do you want? Uh, um, I thought I was supposed to call around, did ya? Actually, um, I thought it was all arranged. I was holding my own so far, not. <laughs> Actually, take it easy, your sense of humour is zero. Can't you see I'm all dressed up? Oh yes, um, I saw straight away. Uh, would you like tea before we cause the sensation of the year? Ah uh, no, I just clean my teeth. Jesus, what an answer. Um, uh, I'll probably spill it on myself, uh, which is worse or on the black Alsatian who was sniffing my crotch while I stood at the door. Kill her, sit down, called the mother. I felt much better now, kill her. Um, I will make the tea anyway, sit down, kill her, stay. I sat on the sofa while the mother watched me and Joan Jett and the Blackhearts played on TV. Both were fascinating, Joan Jett was safer. Killer watched the TV also, but looked around at me every five seconds. <laughs> The mother said, you are not one of the usual fuckers who comes to see her. I studied Joan Jett's image intently as if I didn't hear the mother. No ma'am, I said eventually, since I could feel her eyes on me. No ma'am, Jesus, what century are you from? I wasn't sure of that myself. Lucy Block came back with the tea. I tried to manage it without spilling any. Back soon, she said, and went upstairs. Um, where are the twins? I ventured after a while to the mother. The blockheads are out. Okay, that didn't get far. I just sat there <laughs> drinking the tea and not trying to sweat too much. When Lucy Block came down, she said, let's go. I jumped to attention and the cop went flying. The mother jumped back as if I had detonated an artillery shell. Killer jumped up and went for me. I did one of my pogo jumps and he passed safely below me. Both mother and daughter looked up at me in obvious admiration as I flew ceilingward. I was impressed myself, things were looking up. <laughs> Killer careened into the TV and had quieted him before he had a chance to make a second attempt at me. The TV toppled over in slow motion. Before anyone could grab it, it fell from the table onto the floor. Sparks flew, but not between myself and Lucy Block. They flew from the back of the set like the backfire from a Katusha rocket. The lights in the room flickered once and then died. Killer started growling. The mother started cursing and flicking her cigarette lighter on. She tripped over Killer as she tried to escape to the kitchen. The lighter flying through the air and the flame purged. 
I waited in the dark with the cigarette smoke spoiling my interesting pale white skin and pink lungs, my radar sounding Lucy Block, my hands sweating, my calves tingling, my life flashing in front of me, the blockheads feeding me to kill her, my mother sighing over my open grave, the mourners doing the pogo, my aunt weeping into the bony shoulder of her boyfriend's bomber jacket. Well, things can't get any worse, I thought, but I was wrong. <laughs>